The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith was published in 1776, the same year as the official start of the American Revolution. It was also the same year that Thomas Paine published Common Sense and pushed the age of revolutions forward for the next few decades. Thomas Paine was born in England in 1737, and his early years were, as historian Eric Foner put it, quote, a period of unrelenting failure, end quote. He ran away from home at the age of 16, couldn't hold a job, went through two marriages. It wasn't until the 1770s in England that Paine would turn towards Enlightenment-era thinking. It was in the taverns with religious and political dissenters that Paine would meet Benjamin Franklin, who was looking for fellow radicals to support their growing movement in the British colonies in America. Franklin would push for Paine to immigrate to Philadelphia in 1774. He would quickly find his place in this revolutionary atmosphere and start to write for the Pennsylvania Magazine under several pseudonyms. He would attack Britain for, quote, ravaging the hapless shores of Africa, robbing it of its undefending inhabitants to cultivate her stolen domains in the West. He would argue for the ending of the slave trade and the freedom of slaves. He would formulate social welfare programs that could provide young married couples with, quote, a reasonable sufficiency to begin the world with, end quote, and a program similar to our modern social security system to protect elderly people from destitution. As the American colonies were quickly militarizing for an armed revolution from Britain, fellow revolutionary Benjamin Rush would suggest to Paine to write a pamphlet for support of independence and a Republican government. Common Sense would sell 150,000 copies that year in the colonies. And by the way, Payne never took a dime from that. All proceeds went towards the revolution. And it would be the spark that obviously ignited the American imagination about a just republic. The story in Harvey J.K. detailed how John and Abigail Adams wrote to each other when Common Sense was first published, about a wave of revolutionary fervor amongst the young college students, slaves, and women, all of which deeply concerned the founding father, John Adams especially because his wife was one of those swayed by Paine's work. Late in 1776, Paine would write the American crisis to inspire the troops as the war started. It began with the famous line, these are the times that try men's souls. Penn would act as the secretary of the Congressional Committee of Foreign Affairs until he denounced Silas Dean and Robert Morris for trying to profit off the revolution. This would lead to his expulsion from the Congressional Committee in 1779. He worked as General Nathaniel Green's aide-de-camp for the next few years. In 1780, he would publish his next work, The Public Good, where he called for the land west of the 13 colonies to be for the government and the people, when people like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Richard Henry Lee, the ancestor to Robert E. Lee, and others wanted the land to be owned by the Virginia Company a company they respectively had ownership in, of course. Payne would leave for Paris in 1781 to successfully seek funding for the revolution and to get away from the animosity of the growing political establishment. The revolution ended just a couple years later in 1783. Payne would go on to help overturn the State Assembly of Pennsylvania from exclusively landowning white males to, quote, a one-body assembly with universal manhood suffrage, says historian Harvey K. Payne was in conflict with the Federalists even though he was in favor of a strong federal government. John Adams and the Federalists feared the tyranny of the majority, or as Karl Marx would put it nearly a century later, the dictatorship of the proletariats. Paine feared the tyranny of minority more, which is why he had a vision of popular sovereignty that was the solution to governance issues. He viewed institutional checks on the sovereignty of the people as a threat to liberty. Paine became disinterested in the formation of the bourgeois liberal government in the United States and decided to focus on public works and inventions. So Benjamin Franklin asked Paine in 1787 to gather funds in Europe for a bridge he wanted to build in Philadelphia. Paine would travel to London first to look for funding in the heart of the Industrial Revolution that was going to change the world forever. Paine would travel to Paris as well, and while traveling back and forth between London and Paris, he saw the rise of the French and Haitian revolutions. The reaction of the outside world of this growing revolution in France was best contrasted between Irish conservative statesman Edmund Burke and British American revolutionary Thomas Paine. In 1790, Burke would publish Reflections on the Revolution in France, denouncing the revolution as a destructive force and defended the monarchy there. He perceived the revolution as tearing the fabric of society. Burke, who was devoutly religious, also vehemently defended the power of the church over society. Burke predicted through the chaos of the revolution a popular general would take power one of the few predictions he got right. Thomas Paine was fascinated with the French Revolution, and like Jefferson, felt a revolutionary kinship with the movement. He would write The Rights of Man in two parts in reaction to Burke, 
and also be involved with the National Assembly. Combining his work Grand Justice in 1795, Paine would lay out the blueprint for the modern social democratic philosophy we see in FDR and Bernie Sanders 100-200 years later. He would lay out programs for land and wealth redistribution, a universal one-time capital grant for both men and women when they reach the age of maturity, similar to a universal basic income except it's not annual, just a one-time capital grant. He also was the creator of the U.S. Social Security program well over a century before it was actually implemented. He also had the notion that all people must pay a 10% tax on all personal and private property in a way to deal with the hoarding of wealth while giving an argument for ownership of the means of production half a century before Karl Marx. Thomas Paine stated, Personal property is the effect of society, and it is as impossible for an individual to acquire personal property without the aid of society as it is for him to make land originally. Separate an individual from society and give him an island or a continent to possess, and he cannot acquire personal property. He cannot be rich. So inseparable are the means connected with the end in all cases that where the former do not exist, the latter cannot be obtained. All accumulation, therefore, of personal property beyond what a man's own hands produce is derived to him by living in society. And he owes on every principle of justice, of gratitude, and of civilization a part of that accumulation back again to society from whence the whole came. If we examine the case minutely, it will be found that the accumulation of personal property is, in many instances, the effect of paying too little for the labor that produced it, the consequence of which is that the working hand perishes in old age and the employer abounds in affluence. This was revolutionary and again would be arguments that were echoed later on by Karl Marx and other well-known Marxist, communist, socialists, and the like. Paine would lay the philosophical bedrock of the entire modern socialist movement with this understanding of the exploitation of labor and the pre-Keynesian welfare programs.